Another example of emergent design, I'm glad you two got up and said, you know, that things, you're not going to talk about a shiny um, story that's all finished. I'm not going to talk about a shiny story that's all finished either. Um, it's definitely in the space of emergent design. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different focus. My history is that I'm a, a, trained as a graphic designer. Um, I'm also a social worker, and then I mashed that all up with business. Um, and that's what I consider to be the basis of social design, to have those three different skill sets. And as you'll see, it's very mashed. Um, I even mash up the with and for thing, because um, I chair the International Association for Community Development. When I've got that hat on, I'm definitely in the with camp. camp. Um, I work with people, I work with communities. But in some ways, that's not always a purist um, stance, and sometimes you've got to work um, for people and then try and work backwards to include people. So these stories that I'm going to tell you are, are examples of mashed up design. Um, when I first trained as a social worker 20 something years ago, um, I worked in some of Queensland's most disadvantaged <coughs> communities. I'm not talking about indigenous communities here, I'm talking about um, communities in, in and around the major cities of Australia. Um, those communities nowadays are still the most disadvantaged communities in Australia. So as a shiny new social worker, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, I thought my job was to work myself out of a job and to, um, to address disadvantage. That hasn't been addressed. 20 something years later and those communities are still ranked the most disadvantaged communities in Australia. I hate it when you get to the age where you have to keep putting glasses on and off, I apologise for that. Um, most of those disadvantaged communities are what the people in the States would call rust belt communities. So they're former centres of manufacturing, they're places where factories have been closed. We've heard a lot of news lately about um, particular industries restructuring and closing and moving offshore. Um, a lot of those areas that are still the most disadvantaged areas in Australia are those areas where those factories um, were and, uh, and still are to some extent. And the people who are increasingly disadvantaged are the people who worked in those factories. So they're people who don't necessarily have um, well-developed skills, they haven't necessarily finished school, and it's really difficult to move from that in, um, an environment into an environment where you know, those sort of jobs just aren't available anymore. Um, definitely need grassroots responses to that, and I would advocate um, using co-design as a process to engage people around how we can solve issues on the ground. But my experience is that we need to also um, work design with those disadvantaged communities, but be careful that we don't co-design excitement that then leads to nowhere. <laughs> and this is my experience. You know, in a lot of cases, what, what there's a lot of around at the moment is a whole lot of really exciting design events and design jams that excite local people to the possibilities, engage local people. But if we're not careful and we don't do system design at the same time as we're doing co-design with people, then effectively what we could be in danger of is exactly designing this sort of a system where people get excited but there are no pathways out of disadvantage. And to me, I don't want to turn around in 20 more years' time and still be in a position where we, we are um, generating a lot of excitement but not delivering any results. <coughs> um, so the, the very brief snapshots that I'm going to give you of work I've been doing in those communities um, takes the designing with into much more of a systems level. So again, I'll refer to Jax's um, PowerPoint slide before about the community level and the system level. This sort of work sits in between those two levels and it's designing definitely with people who are experiencing disadvantage, but also designing with employers because most of the disadvantage in those communities is around joblessness. 
And so if we just focus on the people who are unemployed and don't actually co-design with the employers, then we're only addressing the supply side of the equation, not the demand side. Um, and also the service providers, because it's not the case in any of these communities that there aren't huge numbers of people desperately trying to address disadvantage. Um, and the service designers all think that they are addressing disadvantage. So to exclude them from the co-design um, process is equally dangerous. Um, I mean, interestingly, in some of these so-called Rust Belt communities, it's actually the, the professionals who are working with disadvantage who are the growth industry. So um, that's a real paradox in terms of designing a different system because they're actually focused on you know, disadvantage and maintaining, to a certain extent, their jobs inside a system that's actually disadvantaged. So what I'm going to just um, briefly mention, and I'm not going to talk about the specific place in this example, um, only because I don't have permission to do that. And I do take the role that... Um, John Thackera um, puts forward about the designer being a facilitator very seriously. So it's not my place to talk about the details of the place um, in this instance, but we're talking about system redesign. And in this particular region that I'm talking about, it's definitely one of the Rust Belt um, regions of Australia. Um, you will have heard multiple times over the last few months um, comments around regions like this, um, factories closing down. Um, and in some ways, when we look at that as a system, what we can experience is a massive hole in the ground where we're pouring in resources from all over the place. Because if we look at the economics of these regions, they're not resourceless. In fact, now there's more resources than ever being poured into those places. It's about how do we design the, that flow of resources so that it actually reaches the people who are experiencing disadvantage. Because as we'll see in, um, in a mapping of the system, what happens is the resources flow in and then bounce off the most disadvantaged places in those regions and bounce off into the pockets of professionals, contractors, consultants, and it doesn't actually reach the ground. So, in this particular process, what we wanted to start with is not the usual, you know, let's go in and do a needs assessment. There are millions of needs assessments about the most disadvantaged communities. We don't need any more needs analysis. Um, we need to know what to do with those needs. And that requires a mapping of the system. So, in this instance, we wanted to create a map that we knew was going to be in perpetual beta mode. Um, so we didn't want to concretise anything, but we wanted to know, A, what was happening in that region that was already trying to get, address disadvantage, and B, what was the learning from around the world about the things that needed to be in a system if we were going to effectively address disadvantage. We wanted to combine that in a way that did not overwhelm people. So we started off with the whiteboard maps that looked um, very much like the whiteboard map that um, you put up before that was extremely overwhelming and complex. Um, but we wanted to hone that down so that people could look at a map of the system and, uh, and identify themselves, see themselves, which was really important because if they didn't see themselves in the map, then they couldn't experience and engage with um, what we were trying to design. But we also wanted to make it very accessible. So I've put a tiny map. Um, this map, this afternoon, as we speak, is actually going through a, um, a, a, the final vetoing process um, before it becomes publicly in beta mode. So um, I'll be able to share that in a much more readable format um, after that happens. Um, what, why did we want to ma map the system? Um, mostly it was because we wanted to avoid what we saw was happening that we call the meerkat, the meerkat syndrome, which was disadvantage, disadvantage, oh, quick, quick, find something, find something to do, um, oh, funding, funding, there's funding over here, let's do this. And innovation starts to be driven by that 
rabbit in the headlight meerkat um, syndrome where we go for the innovation based on the funding pool. We wanted to avoid that and to see if we could take a back step and look at where the gaps and the opportunities are and then intentionally design responses to that, um, those gaps and opportunities. Um, so we wanted to look at, see how the parts all link to the whole. We wanted to be able to see the gaps and opportunities. We wanted to be able to identify the design challenges at a system level. Um, and we wanted to be able to start to design innovative responses. That's where it starts to become a co-design process. So we did not start with a co-design process here because we had an eight month time frame. Um, if we had involved all the stakeholders who were in the system in that particular region, we would have needed an eight year time frame um, to really work in um, what, what their responses were. But we, we needed to be able to test that with people to see if they could actually see themselves and whether it actually made sense. So it was a conversation with and for. And we wanted to pe people to be able to jump out of their silo and say, okay, this is how I fit into the system, but this is how everybody else fits into the system as well. Um, based on that, we're in the next phase now of looking, we found four major gaps in that particular system and we're in the second phase now where we're going to start to design responses. The responses will be directly related to that flow of resources. So this is not a region that lacks resources, but when we map the resources they don't flow into the most disadvantaged communities. So watch this space, it will be um, out there, it won't be the normal addressing disadvantage um, response. The second brief snapshot I just wanted to share with you is something that I'm working on in a number of other regions which um, we're starting to call democratised design because one of the, the, the difficulties of working in this space um, is that this is the sort of picture that starts to emerge about designers um, <laughs> that somehow if you add designers there you become a knight in shining, shining armour on something. <laughs> um, tab designer will fix this advantage. And it's a really dangerous position to be in. I mean, it's dangerous for me as a designer to create any kind of expectation that I can come into something that has been, you know, operating in a certain way for a very long period of time and in a few workshops or a few months create some major shift. But it's also dangerous from the community's perspective because that's just not realistic and it's not reflective of the complex interplay that needs to happen. So the way that we're um, starting to explore getting around that is to, to do a democratised design process where we put major stakeholders um, in the systems of the regions into a room and over time we do all the deep dives and we do the ethnographic research um, before they all come together uh, in, in, the, in the workshop but then we actually train people to become designerly themselves so that they're not dependent on us as the flying flyer FIFO designers <laughs> they can actually start to utilize the skills and methods and the principles of design I'm not saying that they're going to become professional designers but they can start to experience the processes of um, design and to use those to create their own um, solutions to their own issues um, our experiments, like we've had lots of failure too, I was really interested to see that there's um, actually the word failure on the back of this computer because that was quite salutary while I was sitting there staring at it um, before. There's lots of failures in this sort of experiment. When you try and run workshops around design, it does become much more of a FIFO workshop. So I moved from being a FIFO social designer to being a FIFO workshop um, runner in the skills and methods of design. So the, the learning from that is that just running workshops isn't good enough either. We need to build the platforms um, so that people can continue the dialogue. Um, and one of our very early prototype um, 
examples of a platform like that, you can have a look at at BernieWorks.com if you have a look at that. It's the beginnings of starting to do that process. This was um, a social design process that we ran in Burnie in northwest Tasmania. And again, it was about mapping the system, but it was about mapping the system um, as a co-design process. So not the previous example, which was you know, looking at um, the big picture system. This was actually getting the stakeholders in the room and mapping out the system. But not just mapping out the system, giving people the skills to actually continue that work and to put it out there. Um, when we started getting employers directly engaged in doing customer journey maps, for example, with people who are experiencing unemployment, um, it opened up a world of potential innovations. Um, the idea of democratised design is so that people can obviously design their own futures and um, so that, you know, that the designer can take a little bit of a backseat. Um, and that's all. Um,